what we've covered so far is block ciphers and stream ciphers. Both of them are using symmetric key cryptography in that with when we saw DES, when you saw it in your homework, uh, so same with AES, the advanced encryption standard, even RC4, which is a stream cipher. In all of them, the sender has a key and the receiver to decrypt must have the same key. Okay? So by symmetric ciphers, we mean that the key is the same at both sides. There's one key and it must be kept secret. That's the most common form of cipher. It's been around for a long time. All the classical ciphers use that approach where you need to have some secret and to decrypt you need to know that secret. In the last 30 or 40 years, and maybe a bit older than that, but not so publicized, people come up with a new form of cryptography that avoided the need for both sides to have the same secret. The problem with requiring the same secret, that is at the encryptor and decryptor, is that somehow that secret, that key, needs to be distributed. So if I want to encrypt something and send to you using DES, I choose, for example, my DES key, and somehow I need to get that DES key to the destination so that they'll be able to decrypt. How do I do that? How do I send my key to someone else? Assuming they're on the other side of the world, okay, you know, we want to communicate across the internet. I want to en encrypt a file using DES. I choose some random 64-bit key, I encrypt. I can send the ciphertext, the encrypted file, to the destination via the internet. But for them to decrypt, they need to have the key. How do they get the key? Any ideas? a voice call over the internet but but the problem with that is that we're assuming that the internet is not secure that's why I'm encrypting the information in the first place so when I send let's say my email message I want to encrypt it why would I want to encrypt an email message because I don't trust the internet service providers or someone in between my computer and the destination because possibly they can read my message so picking up the phone or, or Skype or a uh, online application to make a voice call, still we have to send that key via the internet. So that doesn't help because if someone listens in, listens into my Skype call or my uh, message that I send and sees the key, then of course they can decrypt my file. Any other ways to send the key to someone? Okay, some physical device that generates some key, let's say based upon some timestamp or current time it generates a key. How do I get that device? I want it, with the internet we want to communicate instantly. I, I want to send an email to someone. For that approach to work, that person I want to communicate with must have this same device that I have. Not so convenient. Maybe I can post it to them, so maybe in a week's time they can read my email but not so useful for real-time communications or, or at least normal internet communications. In the same way that maybe I could write on a piece of paper my key, put it inside an envelope and use the old snail mail, the post, to send it. So long as I trust the post, maybe if it's very secret, maybe someone just read, read the letter at the, at the receiver and see the key. So what else can I do? Fly there, expensive, okay. <laughs> not very convenient. Anything else that I can do to send someone the key? If I send it across the internet, someone may be able to see the key. What Hidden messages. Hidden message, okay. Steganography, there's one way. Uh, hide that key inside some other message. Okay, as one option, uh, but I have to tell for that to work, for the person to find the key from the hidden message, they must know the algorithm for how I hid it. So, how do I tell them the algorithm for how to hide messages or how to unhide messages? 
it's the same problem. So it's getting this in the initial information to the receiver is, is possible, but quite inconvenient with the normal approaches we have. What about if we encrypt the key? Then how do we, if I encrypt the key, then I need another key to encrypt it, then how do I get that other key to the other person? It's the same problem. So using symmetric key encryption works, except there's a problem of key distribution. Asymmetric cryptography tries to overcome that problem. It provides encryption by using two different keys. Not the one same secret key, but a secret key and also a public key. A key that everyone can know, including the attacker or malicious user. And what we'll see, and we'll see it after the midterm, what we'll see is with asymmetric cryptography, what you do is you encrypt using your algorithm using a public key and you send the ciphertext to someone and only the person who has the corresponding private key can decrypt. So the idea is I want to send to someone, I encrypt, so every user has two keys, a public and a private key. So the destination has their own public and private key. If I want to send something to them, I encrypt it with their public key and the algorithms are designed such that only the person who has that corresponding private key can decrypt. And that's a way to avoid having to distribute the keys. We still need to distribute a public key, but by definition a public key we can just tell everyone. We don't have to keep it secret. Now we're not going to cover how that works until after the midterm. But some of the mathematics that it depends upon, the, the example algorithms we'll look at, require some different, uh, or some things that you may not know. And that's what we're going to cover today. It's a very simple number theory. Some of it you'll already know. And we'll just quickly go through to refresh your memories. Some of it will be new. So this topic on number theory is going to support the next topic on public key cryptography. Start simple. And we'll go through some examples as we go. If I have some. You know that a number has a number of divisors, or sometimes we call the factors. A factors of any number we can find. Uh, let me get organized here. So just some definitions and terminology. So you know this, but, or at least most of this, but uh, you may not have used the, the terminology. We can say some number, some B divides A, where both B and A are integers. If A is equal to some other integer, M multiplied by B. That is, 2 divides t uh, the way we write it. 2 divides 10, for example, because 10 equals 5 times 2. Okay? So we can work out what the divisors are of some integer. So what are the divisors of the number 10? What divides 10? 10, 2, 5, 1. Okay? So they're the divisors of 10. So we're dealing with integers here. So that's simple. So sometimes you may see the notation written as for example, a divisor B or 10, B is a divisor of A, so 2 divides 10, for example. That's nothing new, just some terminology. So the other way you think of it is a factor. So what are the, the integer factors of 10, 1, 2, 5, and 10? The numbers that can divide 10 and give us an integer as a, an answer. And the other thing you probably know is that can, we can look at two numbers and find the greatest common divisor. So what's the greatest common divisor of 10 and 15? 
5. So we just look at the divisors of 10, 1, 2, 5, 10. The divisors of 15, 1, 3, 5, 15. And what's the greatest common number? 5 in that case. So the greatest common divisor is something that we see sometimes. There are algorithms to find that, that is when we have large numbers to more efficiently determine the greatest common divisor of, of two integers. We're not going to cover the Euclidean algorithm, but there are ways to implement that. Something that you may not have heard of, we mentioned it in a previous topic, uh, but we didn't really explain it. We can say that two integers are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is one. Okay. So here's a concept that, which I think is new to most of you, uh, relatively prime. So we compare two numbers. If their greatest common divisor is 1, then we say they are relatively prime. So don't confuse it's a prime number. It's slightly different. The two integers are relatively prime if the divisor is 1. Are 10 and 15 relatively prime? The integers 10 and 15, are they relatively prime? No. The greatest common divisor of 10 and 15 is 5, so it's they, those two numbers are not relatively prime. What is a number that is relatively prime with 10? So a number, so given the number 10, find another number which is relatively prime with it. And there may be multiple answers. Some people have said an answer, some have said a wrong answer. Again, a number which is relatively prime with 10. 1, 3, 5 is not because 5 and 10 have a greatest common divisor greater than 1. 2 is not. So there are many, okay? So we look at the divisors of 10, 1, 2, 5, and 10. They cannot be relatively prime with 10. And any numbers which are multiples of 10 or of, its, of the divisors. So 1 is relatively prime with 10. 3 is relatively prime with 10. Is 4? Four? 4 is not, because 4 and 10 have a greatest common divisor of 2. Okay? 6 is not, because since 10 is an even number, it has a divisor of 2, so any other even number will also have a, an, a, div a divisor of 2. So we can work out which integers are relatively prime with each other. We'll use that as we go through. Another thing that you know about, I'm sure you've seen, is prime numbers. So a prime number, or an, an integer, an integer greater than 1 is a prime number if and only if its divisors are 1 in itself. So the definition of a prime number. And we can often, uh, oh, we can always factor any integer into divisors which are primes. Before we go into that definition, some example of prime numbers, and you would have seen them, is on the next slide. So this is a list of the prime numbers which are under 2,000. So all of these, for example, the number 97 is a prime number because the divisors of 97 are 1 and 97. And that's it. There are no other divisors. So our prime numbers. Prime numbers are used in a number of the ciphers that we look at with asymmetric cryptography. Any integer, doesn't have to be prime, any integer can be factored into prime numbers. So choose any number and we can find its factors or its divisors which are all combined of prime numbers. And sometimes we may write that 
and let's give an example to show that. Note that there's a mistake in this, this equation here, where A equals P2. P is a prime number. Instead of 2, it should be 1 here. This first P2 should be P1. So you can fix that in your notes. If we have prime numbers P, like the first prime number, the second prime number, the third prime number, P1, P2, P3, then any integer A we can write as the multiplication of those prime numbers raised to some exponent. Let's give some examples. Let's write it on the board for these simple ones. Uh, let's do it on the screen. What's the, what's the, write the number 18, for example, as, find the prime divisors of 18, the prime factors of 18. Okay, 18. So 18, and we'll write them in a moment, you'll try another one, is 2 times 9, or 2 times 3 to the power of 3. 2 and 3 are prime numbers. So we can break 18 into the multiplication of multiple prime numbers. What about 22? Find the prime factors. And 24. Okay, so we can write them. Let's see if I can write that so it's a bit clearer. So some examples, what have we got? We can write 18 as 2 to the power of 1 multiplied by 3 to the power of 2. Where 2 and 3 are prime numbers, P1 and P2, and some exponent. And similar, we can consider any integer. Another example is 22. What are the prime factors of 22? Remember, 2 is a prime number. It's, we can write it in as 2 to the power of 1 times by 3 to the power of 0. Let's list all the prime numbers up until the maximum one. Sometimes useful. What else do we have? 7 and 11 to the power of 1. So one way to be complete is to, to look at the prime numbers in sequence. So the first five prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7 and 11. 22 is any integer is made up by multiplying prime numbers together, the prime factors. In this case, it's 2 to the power of 1. Well, we don't have a 3 in here. We can say 3 to the power of 0, which is just 1. Multiplied by 1, by 1, by 1, and multiplied by 11 to the power of 1. Or we could have, in shorthand, write 2 to the power of 1 times 11 to the power of 1. Sometimes we look at the exponents. And 22 is simply, if we write the prime numbers in order, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. That's used in some forms. I don't think we'll see it in any other examples. So just a characteristic of all integers can be factored uh, into prime numbers, or have prime factors. And that will become important later. One more example, what is it? 24. What is 2 to the power of 3, which is 8, times by 3 to the power of 1, which is 3. So again, the exponents here are 3 and 1. So in theory, any integer can be broken into its prime, prime factors. In practice, with large integers, finding the prime factors is very time consuming. But it's for very large integers, when we're talking about hundreds of digits, hundreds of digits long, finding the prime factors of a very large number is effectively impossible. 
with the compute power we have. There are no known algorithms that can do it in reasonable time. We'll see that that's a, an important part of some security algorithms later. So simple stuff so far. We have prime numbers. We have divisors. We have a greater, greatest common divisor. And maybe the only new thing to you is two integers are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is 1. Any questions? Nothing complex yet. Next thing. What are, when we do normal arithmetic, ignore modular arithmetic, when we do normal arithmetic, what are the operations that we, we know and we use all the time? Arithmetic, when you learned in primary school, what are the operations, the first operation you learn? Addition. Second, subtraction, multiplication, division. Any more? Mod? Uh, before mod, you probably learned some, maybe you learned. Exponentiation and logarithms. Raised to the power of and a logarithm, which is the inverse, effectively. So, how, how would I write it? But sometimes exponentiation, you see the hat character, 2 to the power of 3, like we saw in our prime numbers. And the other operation we sometimes see is logarithm. Note that they are related in some way. In that is, for example, exponentiation, raising a number to the power, is just multiplying multiple times. So there's a relation <coughs> between multiplication. So. That's the operations we have in normal arithmetic. And we can see that they go together. That is, we could think that subtraction is the opposite of addition. Okay? 3 plus 2 equals 5. 5 minus 2 equals 3. Okay? So we can say that subtraction is the inverse operation of addition. Inverse of addition. And similar division is the inverse of multiplication. 5 times 2 is 10. 10 divided by 2 is 5. Okay? And similar logarithm is the inverse of exponentiation. So those operations are related. You know them, you're experts on them. What we deal in with in uh, a lot of the security algorithms is modular arithmetic. When we introduce in all of these operations the mod operation, sometimes written as percent. That is, we find the remainder. So let's look at modular arithmetic. So, some definitions first. So, what, is, what do we mean by mod? If we have some integer a and some positive integer n, then a mod n is the remainder when a is divided by n. Okay? That's what we know as mod. n is called the modulus. So A mod N, N we call the modulus. And the answer is the remainder. We can say that two... So what we're going to deal with is modular arithmetic. We can say that two integers, A and B, are equivalent, or more precisely, precisely congruent modulo N, if A mod N is the same as B mod N. So if A mod N equals B mod N, then we say that A and B are congruent modulo N. And we often write that is simply A is equivalent to B when we use mod N. So we often write now 
A is equivalent to B and then in brackets mod N. For example, 12 mod 10 is equivalent to 2 mod 10. Okay? So 12 is equivalent to 2 or congruent modulo uh, in mod 10 they are equivalent. So 12 mod 10 equals 2 mod 10 or 12 equals 2 in mod 10 is another way to think of that. Note that the mod n operator, mod by something, it takes the set of integers, all possible integers, and maps them into a finite set from 0 up to n minus 1. And we often denote that set as Zn. So when we mod by 10 any integer, the answer is always going to be between 0 and 9. Modular arithmetic performs our operations that we have for normal arithmetic, but all in mod n and within the confines of the set Zn. So the answers will always be in Zn when we use our modular arithmetic and in fact effectively the, the inputs are all, all within the set as well. So we'll define that we can, when we do modular arithmetic, we'll go through these six operations and see how they work when we use uh, the mod form. Some are obvious, some are not so obvious. Because this form of arithmetic is used in some of the ciphers that we'll cover later. In fact, we've already seen it in some of our ciphers. We've seen it in the Caesar cipher. So the properties of modular arithmetic, uh, some of them are similar to the properties of our normal high school, primary school arithmetic. So some of them are, are defined here. So when we consider addition, subtraction and multiplication, then how we calculate them in normal arithmetic also applies with modular arithmetic. So some of the, the rules that we'll see, uh, for example, a mod n plus b mod n, all mod n, is the same as a plus b mod n. Uh, similar with subtraction and multiplication. Let's go through some examples and then come back to these rules. Just to make sure everyone's on the same page, everyone knows what's going on. And the examples I'm going to do here in, we can do them in any, with any value of n, but I'll do them with um, mod n, 9, just to keep things interesting. For example, let's assume everything that I write here is in mod 9. Our modular, modulus is 9. Mod 9. So to say, sometimes to save space, I will not write mod 9. I'll just write the normal operation. So let's start simple. What is 6 mod 9? Well, you can tell me the answer very easy, but we can write it in the full form. The way that we think of module, uh, mod is we have some number multiply by 9 plus a remainder equals 6. So some integer times 9 plus a remainder equals 6. The answer of 6 mod 9 is that, that remainder. So in this case, what do we get? Zero. 0 times 9 plus 6. So the answer is 6. Okay, just a very a very basic way to look at mod the modular operator. Modulus. Uh, 23 mod 9. Well, we can do it the same way. Some integer multiplied by 9 plus a remainder equals 23. What's the answer? Or what's this integer?
2 times 9 is 18, plus 5 is 23, so the answer here is 5. Although we don't, we would not use it in most of our uh, cryptography, but just for interest, what about minus 24 mod 9? Same approach, some value times 9 plus our remainder equals minus 24. What's the answer? Try. Some number, some integer times 9 plus something equals minus 24. What is the first, what is the multiplier and what is the remainder? What about, and the, note that this multiplier can be negative, okay? Well, try negative 3. Minus 3 times 9 is minus 27, plus 3 is minus 24, so the answer is 3, okay? So minus 24 mod 9 is 3. Okay. I don't think we'll see the, the negative mod. We, we saw it in Caesar cipher, in the ciphers earlier. And I think you've seen it there, but I don't think we'll see it much later than that. That's easy. That's very basics of modular arithmetic. Some properties that hold when we do modular arithmetic, the, when we add two numbers in mod n, when we multiply numbers in mod n. Similar r rules or laws that we've seen in our normal arithmetic. For example, this one is w plus x mod n is the same as x plus w mod n. So that law still holds. Similar, w times x times y, all times y is the same as w times in brackets x plus y all mod n. So the order in which we add them and multiply doesn't matter. And that's the same in our normal arithmetic. 2 times 3 or 3 times 2 we get the same answer. That's all it's saying there. These rules. And we can expand. For example, w times x plus y in brackets is the same, all mod n is the same as w times x plus W times Y mod n. So that's a, a law that you've, you know as well. And we also have identities. That is, 0 plus some number in mod n gives us that number mod n. And that's in normal arithmetic. 0 plus 5 is 5. 0 plus 5 mod 8 is 5 mod 8, which is 5. And also with multiplication, our identity is 1. 1 times some number gives us that number. So this is normal uh, information. Something that you know about, but you probably do not call it, we also will define what's called the additive inverse. For every integer in our set, Zn, where n is our modulus, there's some other value, z, lowercase z here, such that we, we add those two numbers together, we get zero. Okay? This other value z we'd call the additive inverse of w. So every integer has an additive inverse. That is, when we add one number to its additive inverse, we get zero in mod n. That's the definition there. Some quick examples for the additive inverse. And for me, all right, so for the additive inverse, and we're still doing it in mod, n, mod 9, so just make note. Everything on, on the example so far is in mod 9. Keep it simple. And additive inverse, let's call it AI. 
that. What's the additive inverse of 3? What is, try, write it down, work it out. What is the additive inverse of 3? And for a hint, when we use mod 9, remember our set, Z9. We have the values from 0, 1, Six. 2, up to what? 8. They are the numbers we're dealing with when we do mod 9. Everything, every answer is going to be a number between 0 and 8. In fact, every input we can think of simply as a number between 0 and 8. We operate, our addition, subtraction and so on, all operates on values within this set. So again, what is the additive in inverse of 3? 6. And let's go through the full way. The additive inverse is we have 3 plus some number, mod 9, gives 0. That's our definition of additive inverse. When you add the two numbers together, you get 0. And the number will be 6 here. 3 plus 6 mod 9 is 0. So we say the additive inverse of 3 is 6. What's the additive inverse of 6? 3. three. Okay, goes the other way as well. So you can't say negative 3? No. You, not negative 3. Because with modular arithmetic, mod n, or in this case mod 9, everything is within the numbers 0 to 8. We don't have negative numbers here. Whereas with your normal arithmetic, yes. You'd say the additive inverse of 3 in our normal arithmetic is minus 3. Okay, that's correct. But we've got a different form here. In normal arithmetic, you operate on an infinite set of numbers. Here we have a finite set defined as 0 to 8. What's the additive inverse of 8? Easy. The number when we add with 8 we get 0. 1. 1 plus 8 is 0 in mod 9. Okay. So we have additive inverse. Every, every number in our, our set Z9 has an additive inverse. So of those 8 numbers, 0 through to 8, you can find the additive inverse. Always every number or every integer in our set has an additive inverse. So, from our operations, we can do addition. Addition in modular arithmetic is the same as in normal arithmetic. Just add the numbers and then finally mod by n. Subtraction. How do we subtract? Now, let's switch back. In your normal arithmetic, how do you subtract numbers? Well, we said before, we can think of the operation as the inverse of addition. So sub subtraction is the inverse of addition. So we said, someone said the inverse of 3, the additive, in, additive inverse of 3 in our normal arithmetic is minus 3. Okay. So 3, or some number minus 3 is the same as that number plus its additive inverse. We use the same operation in modular arithmetic. Let's try it for sub subtraction with some examples. That is, subtraction in modular arithmetic is simply we add the additive inverse. So all still in mod 9. Let's give some examples for subtraction. And start simple. What's 7 minus 3 in mod 9? Well, subtraction is the same as 7 plus the additive inverse of 3. Mod 9. 
And we know the additive inverse of 3 is the additive inverse of 3 is 6, so we get 7 plus 6, 13, mod 9, because although I haven't written it, all of these operations in mod 9, which is 4. 7 minus 3 is 4 when we use mod 9. Okay, that's easy. Let's try another one then. 2 minus 8 in mod 9. Mod 9. What is 2 minus 8? Try and calculate. Remember, in mod 9, all the numbers are between 0 and 8. So it's the same as 2 plus the additive inverse of 8. And the additive inverse of 8 in mod 9 is? One. The additive inverse of 8 in mod 9 is 1, because 8 plus 1 mod 9 equals 0. So the answer is simply 3. 2 minus 8 equals 3. Okay. So that's something that's the first thing people get confused with. Don't apply your normal operations of your normal arithmetic. Now we're limited in a, in a set when we do modular arithmetic. In this case, mod 9 arithmetic. Same you saw in the Caesar cipher is the shifting by eight positions but going backwards when we subtract. Remember because we wrap around effectively we go zero up to eight, zero up to eight if we take, start at two and go backwards then we end up at three if we go backwards eight positions. If we are at 2 and we move back 8 positions in our Caesar cipher, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, we end up with 3. So 2 minus 8 is 3. So we saw that in the Caesar cipher and, and the subsequent ciphers based on the Caesar cipher. It's just expressed mathematically here. So we can now do addition in modular arithmetic. It's the same as our normal arithmetic. We've defined the additive inverse. When we add a number with its additive inverse, we get 0 in mod n. And we know the operation for subtraction. It's simply a minus b is a plus the additive inverse of b, all in mod n. Next operation, multiplication, same as in our normal arithmetic. Okay, so effectively the same. You can multiply and just mod the answer by n. So in mod 9, 2 times 4 is 8 mod 9, which is 8. 2 times 5 mod 9 is 10 mod 9, which is 1. Okay, so Multiplication is easy, it's just our normal arithmetic mod 9. So addition, subtraction, multiplication. And the same as to do subtraction, we use the additive inverse because we think of subtraction as the inverse operation of addition. The inverse operation of multiplication is division. So to do division, we multiply by the multiplicative inverse. So we've got a new concept. Numbers can have an additive inverse in modular arithmetic. Some numbers can also have a multiplicative inverse. 
and that's defined on our next slide. That was, uh, that was additive inverse. All integers have an additive inverse. We can also define a multiplicative inverse. A is a multiplicative inverse of B if A times B equals 1 in mod N. And that's the same as in the same concept as in our normal multiplication and division. In what would you say is the multiplicative inverse of 3 in our normal arithmetic? In our normal arithmetic, one third. In our normal arithmetic, 3 times 1 third equals 1. 4 times by 1 over 4 equals 1. So in our normal arithmetic, we have a multiplicative inverse, which is just 1 over that number. In modular arithmetic, same concept. The multiplicative inverse, if we multiply the two numbers together, we get 1 mod n. Let's try some. get that out of the way. And let's come back. Don't crash. Why has my computer crashed? My software has crashed. Let's try it on the board. Some multiplicative inverse examples. In mod 9, so still everything in mod 9, what would the, in some, in abbreviate, multiplicative inverse of, let's say, 1? What is the multiplicative inverse of 1? By definition, you multiply one number by its inverse and you get 1. So that one's simple because 1 times by some number, mod 9, equals 1. What is that number? 1 in this case. 1 times 1, mod 9, is 1. The multiplicative inverse of 1 is 1. That's easy. What is the multiplicative, multiplicative inverse of 2? So 2 times by some number, mod 9, equals 1. That's the definition. What is that number? So 2 times something, mod 9 equals 1. So 5. 2 times 5 is 10, mod 9 is 1. So the multiplicative inverse of 2 is 5. Multiplicative inverse of 5? 2. We can see. If 2 times 5 equals 1, then 5 times 2 equals 1. It goes the same in the opposite order. Uh, 4. Three times twelve. 
4. 4 times something equals 1. What is that something when we mod by 9? I think... So again, 4 times by something all mod 9 equals 1. 4 times 7 equals 28. 28 mod 9 is 1. Because 3 times 9 is 27. Easy. 3 multiplicative inverse of 3 we won't go through all of them find the multiplicative inverse of 3 while I try and fix my computer Anyone have an answer? There is no answer. There is no multiplicative inverse of 3. Because there's no integer in our set that when we multiply by 3 and mod by 9 we'll get 1. Okay. We, all we need to consider really is the number 0 through to 8 because they are the numbers we deal with in when we mod 9. 3 times 0, 3 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. When you mod by 9, none of those values will give you 1. So there's no answer. Or we say that 3 does not have a multiplicative inverse. Not all integers have a multiplicative inverse. All integers have an additive inverse, but not all of them have a multiplicative inverse. And more precisely, some integer a will have a multiplicative inverse in mod n if a is relatively prime with n. So 5 is relatively prime with 9, therefore it has a multiplicative inverse. 4 is relatively prime with 9, therefore it has a multiplicative inverse. 3 is not relatively prime with 9, and therefore it does not have a multiplicative inverse. So not all numbers will have a multiplicative inverse. One more attempt. So let's list our numbers. What do we have? Uh, Just for reference. We have one, two, I think the ones we just calculated that have an inverse, four, uh, five. One mapped to, had an inverse of one, two had an inverse of five, four had an inverse of seven, five an inverse of two, seven, Four, not five. Any others that have a multiplicative inverse in mod nine? Eight is relatively prime with nine, therefore should have a multiplicative inverse. What is the multiplicative inverse of eight? It's in fact, remember it can only be these numbers from this set. It's itself. If this is A, and this is the multiplicative inverse of A. 8 times 8 is 64, mod 9 is 1. Okay? So they are the multiplicative inverses in, in the set Z9. 
when we mod by 9. Okay. So not all integers have the inverse. 0, 3, and 6 do not. So now we can do division because division is simply a divided by b is a multiplied by the multiplicative inverse of b. In the same way that a minus b was a plus the additive inverse of b, a divided by b is a multiplied by the multiplicative inverse of b. Some quick examples. What have we got? Uh, what's 4 divided by 2 in mod 9? So to go precise, we have 4 divided by 2 is 4 times by the multiplicative inverse of 2 mod 9, which is 4 times 5. Which is 20 mod 9, which is 2. 20 mod 9 is 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2. That was easy. Try this one. 6 divided by 7. Find the answer. Six divided by seven in mod nine. Everything's in mod nine in these examples. Just Four, six. Anyone else want to guess? So go through the... What's the multiplicative inverse of seven? I've listed them up the top, in fact. Four. So it's six times four. So... Is six times four, which is twenty-four... And 24 mod 9 is 6, because 2 times 9 is 18. So 6 divided by 7 equals 6 when we mod, use modular arithmetic with n equal to 9. Okay. So we can now do the four main operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Exponentiation and logarithm are more complex, but in fact based upon multiplication and division. Any questions? You need to get outside of your normal arithmetic and just follow the basic principles. It's just that you've been doing normal arithmetic for so long, you immediately know the answer. Remember all of our answers, all of our answers when we mod 9, are the values between 0 and 8, the integers between 0 and 8. We don't have fractions. We don't have negative, num we, we don't have negative numbers or fractions or numbers greater than 8 when we do mod 9 arithmetic. Of course, I'm just using 9 for an example. It can be mod anything. Same principles. The two key things that will come up later, we've seen the additive inverse. Every integer has an additive inverse. Not every integer has a multiplicative inverse. Only if that integer is relatively prime with n does it have a multiplicative inverse. And that will become important when we look at the ciphers. and the way, for example, RSA works. So we've done division. Mm. 
we're not going to at the moment go through the other operators. Let's quickly look at a couple of theorems and then one new concept, the Euler's totient function. In fact, let's not go through Fermat's theorem until after the break. Let's go direct to Euler's totient function and define what that is. And later we'll see it's used in Euler's theorem. And it's very important when we look at the asymmetric ciphers. Written as phi of n. The, in short, we may say the totient of n returns some value. And the, the value, this function, it returns the, the number of positive integers that are less than n and relatively prime with n. So what we do if n equals 10, we look at the integers from 1 up until 9, the integers that are less than n, so if n is 10, 1 to, 1 to 9, and count which of those are relatively prime with n. And that's the answer. So the totient of some number, we look at how many of numbers are less than that which are also relatively prime with that number n. We'll see some, some special cases, but let's go through some, some simple ones first. And then we'll have a break. Let's try. What is the totient of 10? What is Euler's totient of 10? n equals 10. So by defini definition, it's the number of numbers less than 10 which are relatively prime with 10. So go through and look at all of them. So. Uh, uh, the long way is to look at all the numbers from one, so effectively from one up to nine in this case. Let's, let's list all the numbers first, I will, so everyone's clear. So the question is, of those nine numbers, which ones are relatively, relatively prime with 10? And to help, what are the divisors of 10? Just to go simple, the divisors of 10 are 1, 2, 5, and 10. And remember, relatively prime is the greatest common divisor of the two numbers is 1. So. 1. The greatest common divisor of 1 and 10 is 1. So this is a number. 2. Is 2 relatively prime with 10? No, because 2 and there's a divisor 2, so the greatest common divisor of 2 and 10 is not 1. So it will not count. It is not relatively prime. Is 3 relatively prime with 10? Yes. 4? No. 4 has a divisor which is 2. It's greater than 1. 5? No, because 10 has a divisor of 5. 6? No, because 6 has a divisor of 2, as does 10. 7? Yes. 8? 9? Yes. That is, 1, 3, 7, and 9 are all relatively prime with 10. Therefore, Euler's totient of 10 is 4. The count of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
So the totient is how many numbers are less than n and relatively prime with n. So we went through the long way to, to do that. You'll try a quick... What's the totient of 24? Try and calculate the totient of 24. And then one more, once you've done that, the totient, say, of 11. So for the totient of 24, look at the numbers from 1 to 23. Which ones are relatively prime with 24? We will do it after the break. Anyone have an answer? So simply look at the divisors of 24. That may help. So with the totient of 24, you need to go through and look at those numbers. And you see is 1 is a relatively prime. 2 is not, because it's a, it has a common divisor of 2. 3. 3 is, in fact, a divisor of 24, so therefore it's not relatively prime. 4 is a divisor of 24. So if you find all the divisors of 24, those numbers will not be relatively prime, except for 1. And any of the multiples of those numbers will not be relatively prime with 24. Anyone get an answer? Totient of 24? What is the totient of 24? The totient is the number of numbers which are relatively prime with it. 8. The answer is 8. And the totient of 11 is 10. For 24, you have to confirm for yourself why it's 8. For the totient of 11, that's a little bit easier. Note that 11 is a prime number. So what are the divisors of 11? 1 and 11. It's a prime number. The divisors of 11 are 1 and 11. So look at the numbers from 1 to 10 and see which ones have a greatest common divisor with 11. And you'll find all of them. All of the numbers less than 11 are relatively prime with 11. That is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And that applies for all prime numbers. The totient of a prime equals that prime number minus 1. And that's on the previous slide. So that's a shortcut. If n is a prime number, then immediately you can find the totient. It's just that prime number minus 1. Because the the divisors of 11 are 1 and 11. So we compare them between the one numbers from 1 up to 10. And of course, none of them will be have a common divisor of 11. They'll all have a greatest common divisor of 1. 1 and 1, 2 and 1, 3 and 1, and so on. The greatest common divisor will be 1. So if n is a prime number, we can determine the totient simply the prime number minus 1. 
if n is not prime, if it's composite, then it's, you need to calculate or count them. And that's what's here. All right, this is some special cases. The totion of 1 is always 1. The totion of a prime is p minus 1, where p is the prime. And we'll finish up, we'll give an example after break, another useful property. If n is the multiplication of two prime numbers, then the totion of n is the totion of the multiplication of, of the totion of P multiplied by the totion of Q. So there are some shortcuts. But if our N doesn't, isn't a prime number or is not made up as, mo as multiplying two prime numbers, then you need to manually calculate it. And again, this will be very important in our asymmetric ciphers because when we deal with big numbers, hundreds of digits, then manually determining the totient is practically impossible unless that n is a prime number. Let's have a break and then when we come back after the break we'll give an, a, a few more examples of the totient and then we'll come back to Fermat's theorem and Euler's theorem. And then we'll, I think we'll look at some hints for the exam.